Good morning. Welcome. My name's Greg Bamber, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the International Consortium for Research and Employment and Work, which is part of the Centre for Global Business at Monash Business School. And we have two partners who are co-hosting this webinar, the Australian Labour and Employment Relations Association and the Industrial Relations Society of Victoria. And you're all very welcome. Let me start by, as usual, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which our Monash University Australian campuses stand and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. There are more than 200 people registered for this webinar. So forgive me not acknowledging everyone, but I would like to particularly acknowledge the Dean of our faculty, uh, Professor Simon Wilkie, and I can see colleagues are with us from around the world, which is the silver lining. If there is a silver lining to the pandemic, it's that we're able to have Zoominars like this with people around the world. I can see good colleagues, Paul Clark from Penn State and other colleagues from the UK and the president of the Fair Work Commission here in Australia, uh, Ian Ross. Um, but my role is to introduce our moderator, my boss and friend, Margaret Gardner, who's the president of Monash University. And many people know her as a professor and a, a vice chancellor and chair of the group of eight research intensive Australian universities. But some of us who are present today are lucky enough to have known Margaret in her earlier academic life too which adds to her suitability to moderate this international webinar. And briefly, she has a, a doctorate in industrial relations from Sydney University. And, and she has a doctorate from Sydney University in common with our keynote speaker. However, Tom's is an honorary doctorate uh, from Sydney. And, and Margaret also in the industrial relations field, was a professor at Griffith University and is a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and had, has served as president of our Industrial Relations Academics Association in Australia and New Zealand. Margaret serves and has served on many other boards and committees and was a, a Fulbright fellow in the US, including at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, so I'll hand over to you, Margaret, to introduce our guest speaker and to moderate the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Bamba, Greg. It's um, really a great pleasure to be here. And we are extremely fortunate to have Professor Tom Cocken with us for this special webinar event. And I'm personally very delighted to see him again and to be able to introduce him to you today. Um, I was struck by a recent New York Books reflection by Michael Powell on how the awful stuff won, in which he says, something has been damaged about the world in which people live. The social, political and physical spheres have all entered a figuratively or literally hotter and more unstable state. Um, and you can probably see why that might have resonated. We seem to me sometimes more like swarms when you're looking at, at our activities in the world more like swarms than groups organized for collective public good. And it is that organization for collective public good and the way it facilitates and is facilitated by a new social contract that I think is necessary to rebuild and stop the awful stuff winning. So I'm really looking forward to what I hope is uh, an important debate after what I'm sure will be an illuminating address by Tom. Um, Professor Cocken has had a long-standing connection to Monash, visited the university several times. Um, some of you may recall his visit in 2014 to speak at the symposium, an event that's held um, jointly with the University of Melbourne in honour of um, the late great uh, Joe Isaac, Emeritus Professor Joe Isaac. Um, 
Professor Cocken himself has had, as you all know, a long and distinguished career and has been really a remarkable mentor to, to many and is therefore for all his contributions much respected by his colleagues and former students and some of them have also spoken at our symposiums. He's a global affiliate of the International Consortium for Research and Employment and Work, the Centre for Global Business and the Monash Business School. He's also the George Maverick Bunker Professor and Co-Director of the MIT Sloan Institute for Work and Employment Research at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, his work over many decades focusing on employment policies, institutions and practices has always worked at how they remain current and relevant within a changing workforce and economy. Um, and his recent work has been highlighting the challenges that working families face in meeting their responsibilities at work, at home and within their communities. And I wanna say it's that sort of work and research and the way it is then communicated uh, into the world uh, and hopefully finding it's um, finding the opportunity for people to act on those research findings. That sort of work is vital to finding new connections and forging a new social contract. Through his pathfinding research, Tom demonstrates that fundamental changes in the quality of employee and, and labour management relations are needed to address critical problems in a range of industries. And I think that understanding it in industrial context is important for how people work through what is now a quite different landscape for labour management relations than it was even 30 years ago. And so I think the topic he raises today, which spans the whole area of how we as people um, gain our meaning through work and how through work we find new connections and that through that you would hope we have some of the, the great um, ability to forge a new social contract. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cocken. I'm really looking forward to he hearing him speak. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margaret. This, what a wonderful uh, uh, introduction and uh, welcome uh, to where I feel sort of back home again uh, at Monash and with all our good Australian friends and colleagues. Uh, I've spent a great deal of time in Australia. I've been privileged to be at Monash. Uh, I've been privileged to, to benefit from the rich history of research in industrial relations and employment relations that uh, has continued to come out of uh, your university and I hope will continue to flourish uh, in the years ahead. It's so important right now that we have the kinds of conversations that uh, we're going to have here uh, today uh, to see if we can't find common cause in building a new social contract. As Margaret said, in, in dealing with all of the dysfunctional and uh, disruptive uh, actions that uh, we've um, been through and continue to be through, some of uh, human making and uh, some uh, of maybe uh, more natural uh, events or unpredictable events like the pandemic. And, and so what I'd like to do today is to talk about how can we learn from these experiences? How can we learn from a longer history of, of, of uh, the need for a new social contract? And then how can we move forward in making it happen? And I also want to make sure that I thank my, my good friend and and colleague Greg Bamber for uh, uh, helping to organize this and to initiate it and to the Monash Business School and all of the, the co-sponsors in this uh, uh, discussion. So I'm going to start with a few comments, but then I would really like to make sure that we uh, have a dialogue as we move forward. So let's uh, see if we can move to the next slide. I'm going to emphasize uh, three challenges uh, that we're uh, taking away from the current crisis in the United States, but I think around the world. I'll, I'll obviously focus on what we're experiencing here. Uh, but uh, first, I think we, we need to really learn 
uh, about how we can make our economy not only more productive, but more resilient and more inclusive moving forward. And then under what conditions, how do we reopen? I understand that uh, uh, in Victoria, just uh, today, you may be lifting a little bit of the lockdown uh, restrictions. Well, we have to do this in acceptable ways and very sensitive ways. And then uh, hopefully the longer run, we can think about how we can build a new contract based on this. But before we do it, before we get into the current situation, I wanna put this in the context of where we have come from over the last several decades. And this is a chart that I use all, of, all the time when I give talks about um, the, the situation. It shows that uh, why we need a social contract and particularly in the United States, but the same trends are, are visible in Australia in other countries around the world, maybe not as starkly uh, shown as this particular chart. But this is a chart that shows if we start way back here in uh, the end of World War II in the 1940s, up through uh, the 70s and into around 1980, uh, the two lines, the productivity of the country and the hourly compensation of, a of average workers moved together so that as the economy grew, so too did average family incomes. Uh, now, some people were left out of that. Uh, women were not as, did not fare as well as men. Minorities did not felt fare as well as whites and uh, uh, people in the uh, 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 sort of uh, what we now call fissurized uh, or gig economy, those who were in that status already uh, also didn't uh, uh, fare as well. And so uh, still we had this growth uh, in tandem, which really kept building our middle class. And then around 1980, productivity continues to grow, but compensation flat lines. And if there's one picture that shows and illustrates why there's so much anger and frustration that has built up in our society and, and exploded then in 2016 with our election, it's this one. Because if we see the economy growing, but we don't see our own family situation sharing in that growth, uh, the frustrations build up and uh, people are looking for a, a way uh, to address that problem. So we have, have seen that uh, moving into this pandemic, we were beginning to come out of some of the, 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 the problems. We had uh, five years of solid job growth. Uh, employers were complaining about a talent uh, shortage and that they couldn't find enough uh, workers. We still had slow wage growth, but because we had uh, pressure for increases in the minimum wage in states, the so-called fight for 15 in the United States, it was forcing some of the larger employers in the retail industry and other low wage uh, uh, firms to finally begin to raise wages. So we even at the bottom began to see some wage growth. But at the same time, as we all know, people were getting more and more worried about uh, how automation may take away jobs and what's the future of work and will robots eat all of our jobs. And so there was some anxiety about that. And we were, many of us were focused on that and continued uh, to be focused on it. We have a task force here at MIT focused on work of the future that I'm part of, and we uh, are, are addressing those kinds of issues. In the United States, we then had this big tax cut for business that further increased inequality. And we have seen more and more rise of worker protests, not only here, but as we'll talk about around the world, with workers expressing a stronger interest in joining unions and finding other ways to get a voice at work through mechanisms that maybe go outside of our traditional labor law. Even the business roundtable, the largest group of employers in the United States, the big businesses, finally in 2019 made a statement saying, well, maybe, maybe we have to address these issues and maybe all this unrest is getting us worried that our businesses will and our, our uh, free market economy might be threatened. So perhaps we have to start to respond more to these multiple stakeholders at work and not just focus on maximizing shareholder value. So this was the context uh, that we experienced before the pandemic. Some uh, hope, some growth, but then some setbacks uh, with uh, the way in which uh, we were uh, beginning to manage these things. 
But then here comes the crisis. And I'm going to focus on uh, uh, what we've learned here in the United States or what I hope we are learning about our safety net, about the need to rebuild worker trust, uh, the need to uh, navigate our return to work carefully, what the Black Lives Matter and the quest for social and racial justice has done, and perhaps maybe laying a foundation for how we move, uh, move forward. So let me start uh, with what we have been learning here in the United States, uh, more so perhaps in other countries which have had a stronger uh, set of employment standards for a longer period of time than we have had here. But, you know, the stark, uh, the stark uh, effects of all of a sudden 22 million people being thrown out of work in the United States uh, in April and May and June really showed us the weaknesses in our safety net. And it starts with the fact that when you lose your job in the United States, you're likely to lose your health care. That's something we've inherited and, and carried forward from the early years uh, after World War II to today. And it may have worked well in the past, but it certainly uh, is no longer acceptable in the United States. So that we have to find a way now to learn from this experience to uh, provide some form of supplemental or guaranteed health care. And I, that's not a political statement about what uh, form uh, that strategy should take, but it's very clear that on the national agenda, we need to provide guaranteed health care for people, especially the most vulnerable people who tend to be uh, uh, most affected by job loss. We also have this problem in the United States of uh, being the last industrialized country in the world not to provide paid family or paternal leave or sick leave. And so we had to enact some, uh, ex some emergency legislation on those issues just to make sure that we could help those people, particularly in smaller businesses and low wage workers get the coverage that they were needing in order to take care of their family and, and uh, uh, in this very difficult time. Uh, our unemployment insurance system uh, showed up uh, again as covering about 25 to 28 percent of those unemployed. So what did we have to do? We had to expand it. And we should learn from that that we can't leave so many people, whether they're in the gig economy or young workers without uh, uh, enough uh, work history or low wage workers who don't qualify because they don't earn the, the, the income that's needed, or people who are moving across jobs. All of those people who are so uh, common in our workforce today have been left out of our system. So we had to pass um, emergency pandemic unemployment insurance to cover uh, people who have been left out. Uh, all of our countries, and I'm, I'm part of a group with the World Economic Forum that is very much focused on the need to retrain workers today because many of those jobs that uh, were, uh, were lost are not coming back. Jobs in restaurants, in hotels that have been devastated in hospitality and services, but also many jobs in manufacturing because we're gonna reconfigure our supply chains to become more resilient. There's much more investment in technology going on in organizations today in manufacturing and in other organizations so that they can be more resilient and, and, and buffered from future disruptions. And so the nature of jobs that, that are going to come back are gonna be different. And if we don't recognize that we are probably in the, the environment of the biggest redeployment of the labor force of our experience since World War II, then we are gonna have another long-term permanent unemployment problem in the United States. And we're already beginning to see the, the, uh, the, the signs of that uh, happening because the temporary jobs have come back. The people who have lost their jobs on a very temporary basis are starting to come back more quickly. But the longer term unemployed is growing. And that is a big problem. And I believe we're seeing that around the world as well. The, uh, my colleagues in Europe are very concerned about this. And we're seeing a resurgence in, in training in the best companies and in, in some uh, uh, industries, but it's gonna to have to be even bigger. And then finally, we have so much concern here in the United States about retaliation against immigrants. That's our particular uh, 
uh, uh, unfortunate development and, and problem and embarrassing situation where immigrants are often afraid to come out to even apply for benefits for fear of getting uh, identified as undocumented and uh, uh, at risk of deportation. But we're seeing the immigrant issue uh, emerge around the world as well. And so we've got all of these issues which have just been accelerated and made even more apparent by this crisis. And my hope is that it will be a learning exercise. I believe we are not gonna go back to a world where some of these big gaps in coverage of these people that we call essential workers are left out of our safety net. But it's gonna take some political courage uh, to move uh, forward aggressively in that direction. I'm hoping that we will do so. But let me stay on this, this uh, uh, issue of care for emergency workers, because all of a sudden we've discovered the people who deliver our food, the people who are in our transportation systems, the people who are in our manufacturing and food production uh, systems, the people who are in critical uh, supply chain jobs, all others, including and especially those in education and healthcare today. These are now what we are beginning to see as essential workers. Maybe we were blind to their importance in the past or we didn't appreciate them. And we have so many in these particularly human services that are poorly paid. But we've got to recognize that they are calling for a new voice at work. They're particularly calling for a new voice to deal with the safety issues. I'm gonna stress that even more in, in, in a few moments but they're calling for a recognition that they are providing needed services for us while many of us are doing what we are doing right here, able to do the work we do from a remote distant, a remote uh, site, maybe disadvantaged and maybe we complain about it, but roughly, uh, really, we don't have much to complain about. Our jobs are not at risk. Our healthcare is being protected. Our, uh, our family situations are perhaps a bit more stable and uh, uh, um, uh, not as vulnerable as people who are coming back and forth from their work sites. Well, if we don't start to deal with, with their needs and provide them a voice, we have big companies, whether they are Amazon or Walmart or McDonald's or Google or other very progressive employers that are putting in place practices they believe are responsive to the workforce. But if we don't listen to the workforce and their particular needs and their health care needs and their family situations and allow them to have a voice in shaping the conditions under which they come to work, we're going to have a very angry workforce. We have had in the United States, for example, 40,000 new uh, uh, petitions to our Occupational Safety and Health Administration about these issues. Unfortunately, that agency is dormant and is not doing anything about them. They're, but here we have people who, who don't have a voice at work to address their basic kinds of conditions. We have to fix that as part of a new labor policy when we uh, get an opportunity to do so. And we have to open up our labor policy to new forms of employee voice, new forms of, of, of participation so that every worker can protect herself and himself and their peers uh, in these kinds of situations. So that's a, an issue that I think is particularly important. It was important before, but it's even more important now. Well, what do we do when we start to come back to work? I think we are all going to be tested around the world in the ability to understand the conditions under which we can make work more inclusive, more productive, and more uh, effective for all concerned. I mentioned safety, but it's really at the top of, of everyone's list uh, of concerns today. They clearly are asking for more evidence that there's both top-down leadership, the kind of policies that our organizations are putting in place, and that uh, 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 there's no uh, substitute for strong leadership at the top demonstrating a commitment to safety and demonstrating a commitment to the agile and the flexible ways in which people have to work today. But that has to be, be uh, uh, buttressed and, 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 and uh, complemented by 
uh, bottom-up organizing and bottom-up leadership. We teach about distributed leadership at MIT and I'm sure at Monash and at, at all of our universities that everyone can be a leader if given the opportunity. If there ever was a time to listen to the workforce and allow groups to come together to, to express their needs and to work out um, their solutions. Just as, the, to give you an example, just as the pandemic was beginning to uh, uh, emerge in the United States, I got assigned to mediate a very difficult labor management uh, dispute in Seattle with their major nonprofit health uh, hospital uh, system and their nurses and their environmental service workers, that is the people who provide the food and clean the rooms and uh, um, do all of the, the delivery and, and the, um, the services to support uh, the healthcare uh, process. It was a very nasty dispute, but we worked out a, a, a solution and we worked out an agreement to the basic labor conditions as the pandemic was beginning to rage in Seattle, Washington. But at the same time, they said, look, we've got to have a new approach to bringing people back to work uh, when they come back because they were already uh, sending people home. And they worked out a, a, a supplemental family uh, support system. They worked out a process by which uh, the labor organizations would work across hospitals to provide support as needed to uh, deal with the pandemic and all kinds of bottom-up leadership uh, developed with the support of the governor and with the support of hospital uh, uh, management and leadership in the industry. And they set a, a, a good role model uh, and, and, and set of examples for how one does this. We can do more of that because we need leadership from all, all, the, uh, all parties. But we also have to recognize that when we come back, everybody's family situation is a little bit different. And this is very difficult to manage. We in our field have always felt that we should have um, equivalent or equal or equitable treatment of people who work together, who do the same job, um, basically uh, under the same conditions. That's a strong principle of, of our field. But now we have even more challenges because I might have a very different family situation, a very different health situation, than someone else and coming back to work to do the same job, the same work in the same way may not be possible. And that's gonna create some tensions. It already is creating some disparities and we have to make sure that people talk to each other, work out at the work group level. And again, as part of that agreement in, in Seattle, the, the parties recognize this. And one of the things we did was to have a new agreement that we are gonna have a staffing strategy from the bottom up supported by leadership, approved in the end by leadership, but let the teams decide how they were gonna work out these different patterns of different needs of, of people uh, with different family or health conditions or, or uh, needs uh, for variation. That way we can manage these differences if we recognize them and build scheduling consensus team by team and, and so on. Then we have this big challenge uh, at MIT, we now have a, a, a whole group that is looking at how are we going to work more in more remote ways and how are we going to balance that with working in the offices and on campus, not only as we come back to teach, but to do the whole range of activities. And I think every organization is involved in this, this meeting, this challenge today. But unfortunately, we have some vendors out there who are selling software to monitor people and monitoring screen time and monitoring what we are doing with our screen time. And if we wanna frustrate people and lose the trust and support, then we can listen to these vendors and buy their, their tools and use that as a way of monitoring and managing the workforce. Instead, I think we have to start to become even more proficient at managing by project return results. Manage what we do and what we achieve and let's make sure that we have clear expectations for what the, the needs are for project uh, goals and project milestones and project achievements or course uh, goals or research uh, uh, objectives and so on. But we've got to recognize that people have varying different schedules and varying working habits, and we can't monitor them the way in which some of the technologists are offering 
to do so. I'm particularly concerned that that is spreading way too fast uh, in across industry uh, at the moment. And then finally, we, we, we have challenges of how do we maintain our, 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 our creativity at work? We have to find ways to use the technology that we are, are experiencing here today uh, more creatively so that we can manage uh, to uh, substitute for the personal interaction that we all have when we see someone at work and we see that they've got a great idea and they're all excited and they come down the hall or to another desk or another office and start to talk about it and we debate it a little bit and it gets stronger or it gets modified or it gets reinforced, that kind of creative informal interaction is harder to do. But I think we're learning from remote processes and uh, our colleagues, I, I, I hear uh, that, that Paul Clark, our, our future leader of, of Lyra is, is a, a longstanding Lyra leader, helped us all as we developed uh, the virtual side of our uh, professional association and held our last uh, uh, conference uh, uh, effectively by bringing people together and now have uh, continued that with a virtual uh, set of, of webinars and so on. I think we can find ways to do this creatively and, um, uh, uh, and make the most of this technology, but we have to do it carefully. And then ultimately, all of us are suffering a bit from the mental health and the stresses that this uh, uh, raises. And my friends who are in the ombuds profession report that there is an epidemic of concern around uh, mental and emotional uh, health care at work today that they are seeing. So we have to double down on ma managing those issues as well. Well, where does this take us? I believe it takes us right up to the next crisis that emerged. And that was from uh, the renewed protests around racial justice that started here in the United States from tragic deaths of, of black men and women from police violence. But it spread across the world. And we have to learn from that experience too that too much of our, our, our uh, uh, racism and institutional racism, and even the microaggressions or uh, offenses that we sometimes do unconsciously in our organizations need to be addressed more effectively. And we're seeing this happen all around the world, not just as a Black Lives Matter movement, which uh, has spread uh, to Australia and spread to other countries, but also the rise even before that of extremist groups extremist political movements that are, are threatening our democracies and threatening the future of, of, of our world uh, and all of the principles of good employment relations that we have been um, emphasizing and working toward over the years. This is a threat to our democratic values and our principles, and we have to stand strong uh, for uh, equity, for dispute resolution, for recognizing uh, the legitimacy of protest, but doing it then in ways that allow us to address these issues, whether it's uh, Black Lives Matter, the extremist movements uh, uh, that need to be addressed, the backlash against immigrants that we've seen in Europe and certainly in, in North America and the United States uh, in particular, the protests in support of, of your ancestors, the indigenous people, of Australia and of all of our countries. In the United States, we've seen a rise of uh, COVID cases, particularly in our Indian uh, Native American um, communities. And we have to be sensitive to the fact that again, they have been left out of this process. And as you do uh, loosen up from your uh, pandemic uh, lockdowns, the protests and the, the issues that are arising there need to be addressed. So we have seen uh, growing protests. I'm encouraged by them because I think we're seeing young people use creative mechanisms to organize and to mobilize. We've seen it at the workplace, at Google with use of uh, uh, social media, at Walmart with the use of artificial intelligence tools and machine learning to educate workers uh, about their rights at work and in organizations uh, where there have been uh, bankruptcies, like one of our, our uh, largest retailers, Toys R Us, where 
uh, organizations uh, called United for Respect have mobilized workers and demanded severance pay and gotten severance payments for those people who lost their jobs and then achieved a, a landmark agreement to get a voice at the corporate level with what they call a mirror board. That is the employees able to meet with the CEO and top level board members on a periodic basis to express their ideas for how to rebuild the organization and how to come out of bankruptcy and how to rebuild jobs as we move forward. We're seeing creative use of these kinds of mechanisms for mobilizing and, and raising our voices all around the world. We have to figure out how we can incorporate them into our industrial relations and employment relations system and welcome them in parallel with existing organizations, labor unions, collective bargaining, works councils, uh, representation on corporate boards, and the other kind of uh, 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 mechanisms that in, in Australia, as we have uh, the leaders of the Fair Work Commission, that you are uh, responsible for uh, regulating and helping to nurture viable forms of worker voice, the forms that people are talking about today and are most interested in seeing develop. So I think it's an exciting time. And it's an exciting time to take advantage of the innovations that are coming out of our crisis situations and then see if we can't put them to work to build a new social contract that brings the various groups together in our society and new voices. So by all means, we need to engage employers, large employers, small, medium-sized employers, but we have to get to the entrepreneurial community. I'm encouraged by the, the range of entrepreneurs who are social entrepreneurs now, developing these new mechanisms for worker voice, trying to find new ways to deliver health care, coming out to help uh, people now in the education communities to, uh, to meet the needs of kids who are working at home and to find ways to extend the internet more effectively, and to find cures for, uh, 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 for the, 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 the COVID uh, pandemic and develop new uh, ways to deliver um, uh, uh, per, uh, personal uh, uh, protective equipment and to find new vaccines that will help us uh, treat um, this illness. Well, these are the best of entrepreneurs and they need to be part of a new social contract and we need to get them to use their talents to address these big problems that we have in our societies. And alongside that, the technology vendors who are so focused on artificial intelligence and robotics, let's put those tools to work on the big problems that we have and hold them accountable for being constructive citizens in our communities and work then with those of us in education and labor and in government who need to come together. So if there's one thing that I think is absolutely critical for all of us as academics today in our field and in allied uh, fields around us, whether they are technical engineering or social science uh, or humanities. We've got to move from just our, our narrow professional pursuits to addressing these big social, economic, and political problems. And indeed, uh, we're trying to do that through our, uh, our task force on work of the future. We're about to issue a, another report uh, of our group. And this is a group of engineers, the best robotics uh, experts, the best AI uh, uh, experts in our school of science and our best economists and political scientists, all of us working together to try to find a way to deal with the inequality issues, to make sure that we use technologies to advance the world of work, to create higher quality jobs and to create a more uh, equitable distribution of the welfare or of, of the benefits that, that we achieve through these processes. So that's where I think our profession is. It's a very exciting time. It's a very worrisome time, but out of crisis in the past has come new ways to work together, new institutional uh, developments and the invention of the next social contract. So that's our task and I hope we can get on with it. So let me stop there, uh, Margaret, and uh, see if I've provoked uh, some ideas or I would certainly welcome your thoughts uh, 
Uh, we've had we had great conversations about these issues many years ago when you were with us at MIT and periodically through visits. And so I know it's front and center on your mind as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, that was really challenging. And I know there are some questions um, that we will come to to be answered. Uh, and I, I just wanted to um, take your, you back to where you've gone to the point of the myriad forms of unrest. And we see periods of that. And we, we actually know that you get periods of social unrest. And, and then the, the question is, what, what does that translate to? And that's what you're talking about. How do we give voice, effective voice, to, to, the, to the various manifestations of unrest we see, which are reflecting the real life um, circumstances and injustices that particular groups um, feel that nobody is paying proper attention to. So we've lived in a world where um, ourselves in labor management relations where you had movement and the point about movement was movement went to organization. They were called unions. That was your mechanism for voice. You've talked about new forms of new forms of voice. But the other thing you've talked about is, is just the fact that what we once talked about through unions, which was frankly predominantly um, white, uh, male dominated mechanisms of voice, we're now seeing, in fact, a whole series of other questions. So Ray Cooper asks on the web about what, how do we deal with the issue that many of the jobs you're talking about that have been impacted in the pandemic are feminized? And you talked about different family circumstance. What about that voice? What does that mean for our traditional forms of voice and how they're used? Black Lives Matter, very important in the United States, but also in Australia. So this is voice coming at us in different and entirely legitimate forms but in fact, our normal mechanism for giving it, it um, giving it action in the workplace has, has been a relatively traditional one. I know it's changed. Could you just reflect on that? Because this is at the base of a new social contract. Well, thank you, Margaret. And thank you, Ray, for raising uh, that point. Uh, I should have given it more emphasis in my own remarks because I'm very concerned about it. The good news is a lot of the leadership from below is coming from women. And now I'm gonna say something a bit out of school and it's just because we're among good friends and colleagues. Uh, there's no secret we have an election coming up uh, and there's an enormous number of people working on this election. Enormous number of people working for uh, uh, a particular campaign and Many, many leaders in that effort that I've uh, interacted with now are women and younger women. Well, it's not hard to be, a, be younger than I am at the, mo at the moment, but setting that aside, it's the vibrancy and the, the drive, the ideas, the energy, the militancy, I would say, uh, comes through. And I think that's the best sign that we are going to open up and give the next generation an opportunity to really drive the changes. Those of us who have been around for a long time certainly are going to add our views and maybe our experience and maybe some of the scars uh, from, from past battles. But I think the future is gonna be driven by the next generation. We, and we have to open up. Those of us who have been around can't just sit around and say, oh, we've heard all that before and you know, we know better that though, if I ever start to say that you all to, as good friends, uh, let me know about it in no uncertain terms. Uh, and others probably will as well, because I think we have a, an opportunity to let the people who have the skills in using social media, the people who have the energy to, to, to bring new, new approaches to bear, to, to find their way. Now, I'm not, uh, naive about this. There's going to be strong resistance. And some of that resistance will come from our more traditional institutional leaders, some from the labor movement, certainly some from business as well, and some from government. 
And we have to open up and, and provide the, the, the avenues, the opportunities, and the supports, because we can be supporters, but we can't be the ones who think we have the solutions. If we approach it that way, we will find that we're going to lose young people. That's a big worry in this political campaign. There's so much energy around climate change, around gender uh, uh, equity, around racial equity, around uh, uh, other issues that uh, uh, young people are experiencing. And their, their concerns about their careers coming out of this pandemic are, are legitimate and, and need to be addressed. So if we just open up to our institutions, to new forms of participation, not worrying about whether they have formal union representation or some other mechanisms, and then provide them the protections against retaliation and give them an opportunity to come into leadership, I think we will all be better. I'm hopeful that our institutions will respond. I worry about uh, uh, some of the debates and some of the resistance there will be, but I think it's up to us to drive that innovation and to open up those channels uh, for new voices. Um, thank you, Tom, for that. And, and I, I think that goes to some, I hope, of what Ray Cooper was asking. Can I take you to um, just that point you're making at the end? Because the traditional forms of finding voice, particularly through workplaces, we know have been unions and you are looking at all the other you've raised a whole series of other mechanisms and you've referred to other social groups. And Russell Lansbury's, of course, asked the question quite <laughs> um, perceptively, as you might expect, that given unions, particularly in the United States, have a, a quite a limited role in a whole range of uh, industries and workplaces, how do, how do other groups, how are other groups formed and able to operate effectively to advance the voice of people in those circumstances where, and we know in the United States, it can be quite hard to get union representation in Australia, a different circumstance, but nevertheless, thinking that these other groups that you've talked about or other groups organized, this is actually quite a challenge for how they come together to actually give voice because a lot of these things are going to have to be dealt with through through work and employment um, since it's not the only place, but it's one of the significant places where inequality yeah. is experienced. That, that exactly right, and it's a big challenge. We're not gonna get there by reviving unions through the national labor, our National Labor Relations Board procedures. They are so uh, bankrupt and, 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 and so impossible for people to uh, navigate through to, to get an agreement. Yes, we're gonna, if, if, we, we may see uh, some of that grow, and we are seeing a bit of it grow now. Uh, and if we have an opportunity to have a significant debate around labor policy, then I hope we won't just narrowly reform, try to narrowly reform labor law. If we do that, we'll fail. First of all, it will be very hard to do. Secondly, even if, it's, if, if modest re reforms are passed, it, it won't help uh, address the deeper issues we're talking about. We have to open up that law and we have to open it up by expanding coverage, not under the law, but expanding voice and, and, and rights to participate uh, to workers who are left out. And we have to find ways to give universal rights to people to express rights on safety issues. We have to find ways to use our government purchasing power to set standards for all contractors who uh, uh, provide uh, goods and services or who bid on contracts. That's the way we spread uh, equal employment opportunity in the 1960s and affirmative action through those kinds of uh, uh, requirements. And I think we can do that for labor standards in general, for safety conditions, and for worker voice. And so there are a number of proposals floating around on, on how to do that. And I think if we get on with those, we'll extend the rights to voice and we'll, we'll protect people, but we'll allow the various forms to emerge and we will see all kinds of growth of, uh, of, of, of organizations of a variety of sorts. Now, making them sustainable and building them to scale 
and building them to have the power that unions traditionally have had uh, through collective bargaining is a tall order and that's gonna take time. But we have a historic opportunity in front of us to respond to this crisis and to see what people out there are willing to do when they put their, their jobs at risk to protect them, to encourage that, and then to, to channel it. Because we don't just need protests, we also need conflict resolution. We need that to, to resolve, we need that to reach agreements or to, to change practices. And we need to reinvest in our, our energies as either private or public uh, professionals uh, who uh, work to resolve these disputes in way, ways that really build sustained progress. So I think we have uh, an opportunity to open up our laws and our institutions. I think we have a responsibility to do so. And then I think we have to find ways to, uh, uh, to make them work uh, so that they aren't just uh, adversarial protests. That may be the first step, but that has to be translated into productive, ongoing, respectful relationships and, and results that uh, can be sustained. And the organizations have a financial model for, for continuing uh, to, uh, to do their work. Perhaps that institutional question, which you're touching on there, which is quite important, we'll come back to, of course, um, Joel Kutcher Gershenfeld has asked again perceptively about the, the traditional tripartite way that you get what you call at, at national level social contracts across government. Um, uh, but I just I want to come back to that. But before I come to that, I'll, I want to go back to this question of the multiple voice, you know, the standard problem, how does movement become organization and then deliver, deliver gains, which, <laughs> which is the basis on which we understand strategy of collective action, basically. Um, an anonymous attendee has asked the question, if a society is heavily polarized, where people are, don't agree on the minimum terms for mutual advantage, because you have issues about gender, class, race, age, and they may not meld, how do, you, how do you create the contract? And I think this is a really interesting voice question because, you know, if you go back to, you know, early days and I'm sitting in a city where they march for eight hours, <laughs> the eight hour day, um, first march for the eight hour day and one, um, that question of what, what is, what are you giving voice to, which is what anonymous attendee, thank you for your question, um, actually is putting there is really important because we can see a range of protests. People are raising a range of issues. You and I might go to inequality as the way of talking about it, but, but what, is, what is it we're wishing to give voice to in order to actually um, to, to bring these things together to um, a new social contract? And I think that's a really key question here uh, and a good one. Uh, I put it to well, you. <laughs> it's, it's a good question and I don't think I have a definitive answer, but I'll tell you where, where I come from on this. I think, now I can only speak for American society and maybe uh, not even obviously for the full society. I think there's such a thirst in our society, in our communities for coming together, for, a, for ending this bickering and this lack of respect for each other. And the, the, model, the, the, the signal we are sending to our children or our grandchildren, as the case may be, that that's not what we wanna leave as our legacy to the next generation. And I think there are a lot of people who can disagree on everything from uh, workplace issues to issues about reproductive rights to climate change, but still can find a, a bond of civility to talk to each other. And we have to start there. And I think it has to start at the community level. Now it certainly has to be reinforced by our, our leaders. And we obviously don't have that at the present time in the United States. But I believe that the next president of the United States most important task is to bring the country together to model how we have civil dis discussions and how we, we bridge 
uh, polarized positions. Now, that won't happen overnight. That won't rebuild trust for everyone. And we may have some violence from extreme groups, which worries me enormously in this country as a possibility. But we can't let that dominate our national discourse. We have to start. And I, and I believe, you know, to, to link it a little bit to Joel's point about tripartisanism, that's a rich history in our, our, our field. And we learn, need to learn from it, but we then need to go from tripartite to multipartite, if that's a word, I'm not even sure it is. But we have to recognize that we can't just have the existing institution of business and labor and government, that those organizations need to open up to the voices we are talking about, to the new generation of groups and leaders. And we've got to find ways to address that. Right now, uh, uh, I'll tell you a personal story. We've, uh, you know, we all have children or grandchildren or uh, others that, that are doing uh, school from, from home. And so uh, we happen now to live very close to where our uh, two of our granddaughters live, 13, 14 years old. And we've come together in our own little learning pod once a week. And they wanted to talk about racism. So we worked on a little exercise on how bystanders can help deal with these uh, aggressions in the workplace or in their school or in their, their, their social life, not maybe the, the worst forms of racism, but the microaggressions that we all know that sometimes can happen. Uh, and these are kids uh, in this little group that are very diverse and they bring their stories and they love to role play how they could play a more active bystander role. It's those kinds of things. Let's train our, our, our children. Let's empower them to work on these issues. Let's empower people in our communities to work on these issues. And I think we can make some progress. This is this is a rich discussion, and and it there have been examples in the question. Someone suggested the national plebiscite in Chile on um, inequality and how that brought a, a new um, constitutional way forward. That's a different you know way of coming at it. There's there's a range of questions here, but they're all around the mechanisms for voice and how the how voice gets effectively expressed and turned into action in this new social contract, I think, is the one everybody's grappling with. Um, two colleagues. Uh, Marjorie, I, I think you might have a question, my good friend and colleague at Monash, Marjorie. Um, hi, uh, yes, I was interested, Tom, in your views about um, what the uh, resurgence of class identification might mean. Um, in the United States. Uh, here in Australia, the Diversity Council of Australia has just re released um, an interesting research report that highlights that uh, those in the workplace who identify as lower class are experiencing many more issues and how this um, re-emergence of class um, fits with the other demographic categories that um, you've already addressed. Well, I think, uh, Marjorie, one of the uh, advantages of uh, this crisis is that it's laid bare, it's, it's made us more aware of class. Uh, it's no question that women, low-wage women, people of color, immigrants, people who live from day to day uh, or week to week in terms of feeding their families and paying their rent, or finding uh, the basis, the very basics of life, uh, so that the, the, they're the ones who are bearing the brunt. They are carrying us through this pandemic by feeding us and keeping us safe and caring for us uh, when we are ill. And I, I just hope that this awareness that there is a class difference here from those of us who are fortunate to be doing what we are doing, continuing to work in, in some fashion in, uh, in remote uh, ways, uh, it's a privilege and it's a class issue. And so I think if there's a new awareness, now whether that mobilizes in some ways, I don't know, but I think the, the, the class distinctions have been laid bare. And if we don't see them now, we'll never see them. Whether we act on them, 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, now, in the United States, we have another problem that the social divisions uh, have blurred the class lines. And so we have had a reaction from many angry uh, whites, from many evangelical uh, 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 religious uh, community members who are focusing on their social and social identities more than on their common economic uh, conditions. And so we have to respect that as well. We don't have to agree with, with all of those views, but we have to recognize that that is an important part of people's identity today. So I think the class issues uh, have to be addressed in the context of more deeper social divisions within classes. And I don't pretend to have a solution for that, except to begin to, to legitimize people having differences and then focus on our common concerns and our common concerns for, for bringing up uh, the, the, the most disadvantaged people in our economies. And so that we can get a social contract where as we uh, start to come out of this and invest in our futures and rebuild our economies, that we rebuild those economies for people at the bottom as much as for people in middle and, 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 and better uh, positions in, 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 in our class uh, division. So yes, they're there. Uh, they compete for uh, identity with some of the social divisions and we're gonna have to uh, address both. Well, thanks, Tom. And I'm aware that time is ticking on. I've just had a message from a couple of people who are listening in in the UK and saying it's way past their bedtime. Um, and we all have busy schedules. Uh, we, we could really carry on this discussion a lot longer because these issues are so important, not only in this time of pandemic, but also more generally in the future. And before we wrap up, Margaret, do, do you have any other comments or observations that you'd like to make at this point? Just one, I'd really like to, to thank Tom for, for his um, thoughtful and really generous address and also for his reflections in questions, which I think are important. And I want to thank the people who ask questions. And to say that in this time, and I was really <laughs> struck by that title of the, 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 the awful stuff winning, um, in this time when we're trying to stop the awful stuff winning, those really fundamental questions about how voice is, how people are given voice, how they are able to speak to and shape their circumstances is more live now than ever and is not solved and needs new thoughts. And that we need to give clearly not only more thought to, to both the institutions and the mechanisms, but we need to think seriously about what we believe that new social contract should be when, when and as we listen to those voices and how we do that both at community level, if you like, and national level. And I, I just think that these are the fundamental things that I think drove probably most of us into this field. Um, and it is important to recognise that they haven't been solved and there is much work to do. And I thank you, Tom, for your very generous uh, and thoughtful address. Well, thank you, Margaret, Greg, and everyone who helped to organise this and all my friends uh, uh, who uh, participated. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity to, to sort of reinvigorate our, 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 our energy. We need it. Thank, thanks, Tom. And thank you, Margaret, for sparing time out of your busy schedule to moderate this webinar so well. But I'd also like to pay tribute to your enlightened leadership at Monash University and across the sector as a whole, not only uh, preaching about the importance of voice, but also along with the National Tertiary Education Union, uh, providing uh, enlightened leadership to us across the whole sector for those of us who work in higher education in Australia and during this difficult time. And uh, thanks also to 
good colleagues like uh, Chong Wu and Marjorie and Shahab, and also our professional staff behind the scenes who make these events happen. And thank you everyone for joining in wherever you are in the world, uh, different time zones. It's either breakfast time or bedtime or somewhere else in the day. And that's a wrap. The webinar is going to conclude, but let's keep in touch and continue these important conversations. Thank you so very much. Cheers. Thank Bye you. now. Mm.